Hello, everybody. I should say um, from the list of names here, countries that I should see, I should say, um, let's see, bon dia, assalamu alaikum, bonjour, um, buenos dias, hello. Looks like we have a whole range of people from across the world here. So I want to thank uh, Monica, I want to thank Adriana for inviting me to talk with you all. Um, I'm actually going to be using my own slideshow because I have some power, uh, I actually have a movie inside it, so it was actually too big to email. So I'll be toggling back and forth between the um, WebEx and between my PowerPoint. And Monica and Adriana, I'll just ask you that if there's a question, um, please feel free at any point to interrupt me so that I make sure to to answer that question. I have different points during the webinar at which I was going to try to have some conversation and ask some questions. So let me move on. Um, the um, Adriana explained a little bit of, of my background. I do a lot of different things in educational technology. Um, I should mention for the Jamaican here that I actually started my teaching career in Jamaica, and I ended my teaching career in Mexico, um, and then I was in the United States in between all of that. Um, I do a lot of different things around educational technology, but working with teachers um, and working with kids is still my absolute favorite thing to do. So um, I'm just going to start in on my presentation um, and say that you know we know that technology is everywhere, and I assume that you are part of this webinar because you're very interested in technology. And I've just included here a few photos that I took over the last few years of different places around the world that I've been working and the various kinds of technology that people are using. So technology is everywhere, but so too are questions about its ability to improve student learning. And some of these questions are, how can technology impact teaching and learning? Are all applications and technologies equal in this regard, or are some better than others? What can we do to make sure technology can improve teaching and learning? And I think most basic of all, the most basic question of all, is does educational technology really improve student learning? So despite the research, um, the news is not really great. There is no um, long-term body of evidence that actually shows that computers alone can improve student learning, and you probably know all of this. Um, there are many new technologies that we're being encouraged to use, but there really is no research behind them, so we don't know if they can really make an impact. We know they're exciting, but we don't know if they actually do anything to improve student learning. There are many innovative applications and software that we love to use, but they don't show any measurable impact. They don't show any significant difference in terms of student learning. And there's actually um, research that shows that there is um, a negative impact on certain types of technology. So I just saw a question from uh, Egypt about MOOCs. So MOOCs are these massively open online courses through Coursera or edX, um, through Stanford, where hundreds of thousands of students all over the world can sign up for free and actually take an online course. So I hope that answers your question. So what I've just shared here is the bad news about educational technology. But there actually is some good news. And the good news is that we do know from research that if um, we combine technology with instructionally sound practices, or what Robert Marzano calls high yield practices, that some technologies are better than others in improving student learning in very measurable ways. And so in other words, we know that there are some high probability technologies um, that can give us a good return on student learning. And the remainder of my webinar is really going to focus on these. So I'm drawing a lot of my um, data sources. In fact, I'm drawing all of my information from two really valuable and reliable studies on student learning. These two studies are probably the gold standard of student learning. And the first is from John Hattie, who is a uh, researcher from New Zealand who's based in Australia. And he did, um, he looked at over 800 evaluations from across the globe, examining the factors that impact student learning. And he actually has created a list of all of these in a book called Visible Learning. And if you can get a hold of it, I'd strongly, you can actually get the PowerPoints online. I would strongly recommend looking at it. Um, and the second source that I'll use is from an American educator named Robert Marzano. And um, 
primarily his work, which is classroom instruction that works. And he looked primarily at US classrooms. So most of, since we have an international audience, I'll probably draw more from, I am drawing more from John Hattie's work. So the remainder of this webinar is looking at these instructional practices, these high yield instructional practices that have been proven to improve student learning and the ways that these high probability technologies can support and deepen and extend these practices. And you're going to see in this um, webinar that many of these technologies are very simple. Um, and, and I know as a teacher, and I know from working with teachers, the teachers are often pressured to use the latest and the best and the sexiest technology and participate in the newest technology fad. And I would argue that we relax a little bit about that. We don't need innovative uses of technology. We just need proven uses of technology. So let's um, examine a few of these technologies together. Um, so the first that I'm going to look at, a uh, very research proven strategy in terms of student learning is formative assessment. And formative assessment practices have been demonstrated to have substantial positive impact on student learning and achievement. And so there's, um, a we typically talk about a formative assessment cycle, and that cycle often varies, but typically it involves the following practices. It involves some kind of instruction. So there's a lecture, there's a reading, students have to, have to learn something. And then there's some sort of questioning for understanding, assessing where students are in their learning. This can be questions, this can be a quiz, it can be tasks that elicit this learner's level of understanding. Um, and then you, often there's some feedback um, to help the student meet his or her learning goals. Um, the formative assessment cycle often involves reteaching, reteaching a concept where students have difficulty, and this can be direct instruction or it can be peer teaching. Um, often there's another assessment to see if students have made any learning gains. And ideally, although we don't often do that, um, there should be some sort of reflection, having students reflect on what helped them best learn and how they learn. So there are lots of formative assessment techniques um, that use technology, but the one I want to look at here for questioning in questioning for understanding is clickers. So let me just stop very quickly for a minute, and I'm going to get out of this and go back in and just ask you all, um, how many, uh, is there a way to find out how many of you actually use clickers in your classrooms as part of instruction? So maybe you can type in yes if you use clickers and no if you don't, and that'll just help me get a, an idea of where you are. Yes, we have Ramona uses them. We have some no's. Oh, here we go. Oh, so actually, we, I'm sorry, we have a poll. So we have 100% two people. OK. I'm going to broadcast the results just so you can see. So we have, we have several people writing that they don't, and, but our poll is showing more people do. So OK. So I'm looking just at your comments, and it looks like most of you are not using clickers. So that's great, because then I'm not telling you something you already know. Um, so let me go back and just talk a little bit about um, clickers. So, so um, how do clickers essentially work? Well, um, actually, uh, let me just take you through the process. So I'm actually going to give you a quiz. You've just been listening to me. Um, hopefully, and I talked to you about the research on educational technology. And now there's a quiz. So I want to ask you, which of these statements is closest to the existing research on educational technology? Is it A, that most research shows positive impacts of technology on learning? B, most research shows negative impacts of technology on learning? Three, most research shows inconclusive impacts of technology on student learning, or is it D, that there's some research showing that under certain conditions, technology can improve student learning? So I'm actually going to ask you to vote if it's A, B, C, or D. So we have B. We have C, we have D, 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 C, D. Okay. 
All right. So I'm actually not going to tell you the answer. Um, if this were a classroom, um, we've had instructions. So I just gave you a little mini lecture ahead of time as part of this webinar. And then I'm now giving you in the assessment cycle, I'm actually assessing your knowledge. Um, at this point, um, I would go back, if you go back, take you back here for a second to the assessment cycle. Um, now I'm at the reteach phase. So uh, if we were in a classroom together, I'd have some sort of um, reteaching going on. And then I would assess you again. So the way we do this with clickers, essentially, is there's instruction. And then the students have a clicker, and they, they're asked a question. They use their clickers to choose a multiple choice response, an A, B, C, or D. And then um, the professor or the teacher looks at the data. And if, there's, if most students understand, the teacher will move on. But if, it's, if about 60 or 70% of students get the wrong answer, the teacher knows at that moment that he or she needs to do something, either peer instruction or some sort of reteaching. Um, so I think a great way to explain this to you is to show you very quickly a very, very short video from Harvard University. This is a, a physics professor called Eric Mazel. I tried to find high school videos, and I tried to find them outside the US, and I couldn't. So I, I decided to use this. Um, and he takes you very quickly through the process of using clickers as part of his um, classroom instruction. Okay, I love this video because at, I, at the end, this young woman still looks like she doesn't understand. Um, but let's take a look at what happened here. Um, so what we see in this process is that the clicker, um, which you saw the students using earlier, is used to initially assess student understanding and that these clickers provide instant visual feedback to the teacher and to the students so that the teacher can revise instruction. Um, and the way the teacher revises instruction is he does reteaching by, as we see here, going around to groups of students and asking them questions and sort of guiding them to a correct answer. But he also has students working with one another. Um, so the clickers, because they display data visually, at that moment, the, the teacher, they help the teacher make an instructional decision. Um, and later on in this process, um, after the students have have got some help from the professor after they've taught each other, he would actually assess them again using the clickers again. So um, you may not have, it looks like some of you already use clickers, and you may not actually have an interactive whiteboard, or you may not have um, clickers. Um, so how can, um, what are some alternatives to this? Uh, one, there is a software that I use, which is called Turning Point. Um, so you don't need an interactive whiteboard, but you actually do need the software. And it, it displays the results in your PowerPoint. Um, but there's also a number of cell phone-based tools. And I've got some listed here. Poll Everywhere, Poll Daddy, 99 Polls, um, which many of you may already know about. Now, all of these cost money, but they do have a free basic account, which is why I included them here, where you can ask a number of questions, ranging from yes-no answers to multiple choice to open-ended questions. And if students have mobile phones, and most of our students do, they can actually respond to a question with an SMS or a tweet, or they can go to the poll and respond via the website. And then teachers can display the poll results in real time and even in PowerPoint. So whatever you use, whether it's Turning Point or an interactive whiteboard, excuse me, or cell phone clickers, um, the process th is essentially the same. And, and this process, by the way, is often referred to as technology-assisted formative assessment. It's a rather long term. Um, but the process is essentially that the instructor asks a question, the students vote by choosing a response, and then the results are displayed. And then there should be a number four in here. And then the teacher makes an instructional decision. Do I move on? Do I have the students teach each other? Do I reteach? Do I present the content in a different way? So 
Um, the big question here about clickers is technology versus non-technology. So in other words, does the technology really make a difference? Couldn't you just ask these multiple choice questions and have students raise their hand or show color-coded cards? And in fact, um, the research is quite clear that the clickers themselves actually um, make the difference in terms of student learning. So, and why is this? Um, the clickers generate just-in-time visual data that helps the teacher and the students understand the student's level of understanding, and we saw that in this short video. And then by quickly assessing students' understanding of the topic, the teacher can adopt a just-in-time teaching strategy, make corrections, modify content delivery, differentiate instruction, etc. Um, clickers have been shown to be, students think of them as, as being more engaging. And what we know from research on learning is that even low degrees of interactive engagement show better learning results than no interactivity whatsoever. And one thing I like about clickers and using them with students is that they're anonymous. So the student responds, but only he or she and the teacher knows who understands. The other students don't know. So it cuts down on that, that shaming element. So this is, clickers are an example of if they are used a certain way, that is as part of questioning for understanding and formative assessment, um, the clicker can actually, this is an example of technology actually making a difference in terms of student learning. Professor Eric Mazur teaches physics at Harvard. Over the years, he discovered that students in his introductory physics course were passing exams without having understood the fundamental concepts he was trying to teach. In response to this problem, Professor Mazur developed a variety of interactive techniques linked to each other in ways that help his students learn basic concepts far better than before. Requiring students to read, think, and reflect before the lecture is the first step in Professor Mazur's interactive process. He also uses the course website to monitor their learning and communicate with his students. I don't go into the classroom lecturing on what I think they need. No, they tell me what it is that they want me to cover. It was helpful for Professor Mazur to answer those questions that we had and sometimes like it didn't feel embarrassing at all if he addressed your specific question because the whole thing was anonymous. So the idea is to teach by questioning rather than telling. I will talk a few minutes and then put on the uh, overhead projector a question and then I tell them take a minute to think about it. They think about it and uh, after they've thought about it, I need to get some feedback on their answers. So turn to your neighbor and see if you can convince one another of the correct choice. Right. It goes out of the page and the top goes in, so right. they cancel each other out. There is a torque. There is a torque. How do you know that? And B is down, so the force at the bottom would be clockwise. And in a sense, this process, this engagement, this teaching by questioning rather than by telling, forces students to develop these models in the classroom. I think the lectures were really good, and it worked out really well, the idea of everyone teaching each other. And we soon realized that, yes, we were picking up the material faster than we had in the previous physics course that we had all taken. You can forget facts, but you cannot forget understanding. And that's actually exactly what I would like to achieve here. I want them to understand the subject so that they know it for the rest of their life. I'll just conclude here very quickly by saying, you know, I, I've just shown you a piece of technology that's really simple, and many of you are already using it. I mean, essentially, you push a button. So the hard part here with the technology, it's not the technology, it's the instruction. Um, and conceptually, you have to identify areas. You, the teachers have to know their content to use um, clickers as part of uh, teaching for understanding. You ha really have to know your content and know areas where students may be confused. Um, teachers have to be able to come up with good multiple choice questions. They have to help students arrive at the correct answer without telling them the answer. They have to f form conceptual questions. And really, in the reteaching part, I think the real skill is the teacher coming up with thoughtful questions to help students connect ideas and make inferences and um, really help students explore their deeper, deeper levels of understanding and knowing and thinking. So 
I'm going to move on, and the next area that I'm going to talk about, a second very high probability, um, well, let me go back for a second. I talk about high yield practices. A very high yield, a very successful instructional practice is using concept mapping. And this is where technology um, um, can also serve to aid concept mapping. So concept maps are, are diagrams that are used to visually outline information. And some of you may be familiar with this, these. Um, they can be created around a main idea. It can be a concept. It can be a story. And then this main idea is uh, broken into smaller supporting ideas and even smaller supporting ideas, as you can see here. Um, and then the ideas are linked together. And um, concept maps are often, although they're not always, hierarchical. And all the ideas are connected through links. And as we can see right here, a concept map is very analytical because it goes from a very big idea to smaller and smaller and smaller sub-ideas. So concept maps are um, they're just a great learning tool. Um, and they have a ton of research showing their benefits on student learning. They've been shown to improve student reading and writing comprehension. They've been shown to help students and teachers determine what the learner knows, so a great formative assessment tool. Um, help students meaningfully integrate new information into existing cognitive structures. They're great for visual learners. Um, I've worked with kids who have trouble writing sentences, but they can actually visually depict information. When I was teaching writing at the Tec de Monterrey, uh, before every essay, I had my students map out their essays in concept maps. And I found it made a huge difference in terms of their writing. Concept maps have been around for about 50 years, so there's quite a lot of research on them. Um, so how can technology help us with concept maps? Well, there is a software you can buy that many people, including myself, use and like a lot called Inspiration, but it's you know about $100. And online, there are a number of free concept mapping tools. And I'll just leave these here for you to investigate later. Um, so in terms of student learning, is it better to do concept maps with pencil and paper, or is it better to do concept maps um, with software like Inspiration. And really, unlike the research on clickers that shows that um, concept maps actually improve, um, uh, research on clickers, excuse me, that shows that clickers actually improve questioning for understanding model that I just talked about, um, the research on concept maps shows that the learning with concept maps is pretty much even whether you do it pencil and paper or whether you do it on the computer. But I'd actually argue a little bit for doing it on the computer. Because what I've seen with my own students and what I've seen with um, teachers is that you, a lot of students, not all, can often make better concept maps using software than they can using pencil and paper. Um, and you know, I think the color, the visuals, the fact that you can create different types of concept is helpful for a certain type of learner. Um, and the nice thing about digital concept maps is that you can archive them, you can store them, and on three these first three websites, you can actually collaborate um, online with people around the world making concept maps. So um, let me, um, again, just talk very quickly a little bit about concept mapping. Um, so concept mapping, there are some technical steps in concept mapping or mind mapping. But most concept mapping software, like Inspiration, is really quite easy to use. So the hard part of mind mapping, again, is it's not the technology. It's the conceptual knowledge behind the technology. And I think to really capitalize on the learning benefits of mind maps, um, it's probably m more important for us to know about mind mapping in general than it is to know about the technology. So for example, um, there are a number of, there are dozens and dozens of types of concept maps, and they're used for different purposes. So for example, this is a Venn diagram, which we all know. And Venn diagrams show different relationships among ideas, where they differ and where they overlap. Um, circle maps, or areas of influence maps, show degrees of influence on an event, from the least um, influence to the greatest influence, as we see here. The, all these maps, by the way, are made in inspiration. The inspiration comes. A lot of this mind mapping software has templates that teachers can use. Um, this is a compare and contrast map. And these show how things are alike and different. And so comparison obviously refers to how things are similar. And contrasting shows how things are 
are different. And this is often difficult, I've found, for students to understand because it requires evaluating and synthesizing information. Um, but I will say, I've been talking about these high yield tech, uh, instructional practices. And you'll see this in John Hattie and Robert Marzano's work. One of the best things we can do to improve student learning and to teach kids to be critical thinkers is to ask them to list, identify similarities and differences between objects or events or ideas, and then to classify that information. And a compare and a contrast map actually does that. So for example, Hoda's question about social studies, um, you could have two nations at war. You know, what, are, what is nation A's point of view, and what is nation B's point of view, and is there anywhere that they overlap? Um, so it looks like most of you are not using concept maps, but a few of you are. Um, Renee taught me to use them, is what um, we're seeing from Germain and St. Lucia. So let me go back into my PowerPoint, and I will actually show you the websites again. Um, and I'll just mention them. There's, um, there's two that I've used a lot. Uh, one is called Bubbleus. Um, bubble, B-U-B-B-L, and dot U-S. And then the next one is MindMeister. Um, you know, the tricky thing, these are free, but that could change instantly, unfortunately, as we all know from the internet. Um, FreeMind, you have to download. It's a Java-based application. And then the last um, source that I've included for you is examples of mind maps, because um, what I've found often working with teachers initially when they start using concept maps is they use the same kind of map for everything. But the map, the concept map is a lens. Um, and it helps us to filter information or look at information differently. So again, um, just quickly, this is one kind of concept map, a Venn diagram. And it's only good really for one thing. A circle map is another type of concept map. And it, too, is good for one particular way of thinking, looking at the relationship of influences on something. A compare and contrast map, again, this is another kind of concept map. And it's also useful for a certain way of thinking. So to me, what's really important, it's not the cool websites like Bubbleus and MindMeister. It's not the technology. It's this. It's understanding what kind of concept maps help students think in what kinds of ways. So um, I'm going to move on. And um, the third area that I'm going to talk about is writing. And really, one of the most valuable skills that students can learn is writing. And so that is written, purposeful communication in which they formulate a message, they develop it, and they communicate that message to a particular audience for a particular purpose. And when students write, they have to do a tremendous amount of things and a tremendous amount of thinking. There's a lot of skill that goes into writing. So what do they have to do? They have to think through a piece of information. They have to think through what they want to say. They have to structure and organize that information in a way that makes sense. They have to use, um, they have to pay attention to wording. Is the wording interesting? Does it flow? Because as we all know, it's hard to really read. You can have a wonderful idea, but if it's wrapped in bad writing, um, people won't pay attention to it. They have to use conventions of language. They have to use word choice. Writing is about thinking. And helping students write well, I believe, is the greatest thing that we can do to help our students become better learners. And I will just say that vocationally, as a professional, um, to me, the best skill that somebody can have is to, to communicate well orally and to communicate well in, with the written word. Um, people who write well are in huge demand across all professions. So um, technology, how does technology help with writing? It, too many ways to even talk about. Um, but first, the web itself just provides a platform and an audience to allow students, to allow anybody, um, to have their writing read by others, critiqued by others through blogs, through wikis, through writing sites. Um, these are just very two popular uh, sites that are used a lot in education in the US, EduBlogs and uh, Wikispaces Classroom. 
Um, next, this is a little sort of an odd idea, but <clears throat> the internet provides an abundance of writing prompts. Um, so whether it's images or articles or audio or multimedia, I, I mentioned that I was a writing teacher in Mexico City, and um, I found that one of the best ways to get my students to do creative writing was to just pull images off the, <clears throat> the internet. Every day I had them write for 10 minutes about an image that they saw, really just to loosen up their brains and to get them to like writing and to sort of become creative and free in their writing. Um, because I'm a huge fan of using images to promote student writing, um, so for, for example, again, back to Huda's site, there, there are a number of, a number of governments Governments have made their historical um, archives free to, and pictures free, like the Library of Congress in the United States. Um, just having students look at a historical image and write about it is, is a terrific way to promote student learning. So um, because I use a lot of images with students, um, I've included here a, f uh, a number of websites that have free, copyright-free images, Flickr, um, Morg, file, the World Images Kiosk, and then the Wikimedia Commons, which I use quite a lot. And I'll, I'll come back to these if, if you need me to. Um, so there's, and, and the internet is really the world's largest library. So students can access all genres of writing. So in this example, this is just a po the Poetry Foundation, where you can read poetry, you can write your own poetry, you can actually talk to poetry. There's a poetry magazine. and a a lot of this content is absolutely free. But, but I think in terms of the question, you know, could we just write, couldn't we teach students to write well just using pencil and paper? Do we have to use technology? And the answer is we really do have to use technology. This is where the research is really powerful on using technology to improve student learning. Just if we teach students how to go through the writing process and use technology to do that, students' scores on, on assessments are higher than if we teach them the writing process and, not, and we don't use technology. So writing with technology has been shown to improve student learning in ways that it doesn't with pencil and paper if we do two things, and this is the big if, if students are given open-ended prompts for writing, and second, if we take students through the formal writing process, that is brainstorming, drafting, revising or editing, and then rewriting. So there's a ton of data on how technology can improve student writing if we do these two things. So for example, students who write with computers, and this is primarily word processing software, achieve much greater proficiency in state writing standards, and they have much more developed writing responses, and they have higher scores on assessments than students who do the same thing but do it with pencil and paper. So if there's a killer app for technology in terms of improving student learning, it's using technology to help students improve their writing. So again, here we see with these three examples that I've mentioned that the technology is the easy part. We all probably are familiar with using Microsoft Word or <clears throat> some kind of word processing software. The difficult part is conceptual, it's instructional. It's knowing how to teach the writing process. And again, that's having students brainstorm ideas, which they can do with concept maps, um, drafting, drafting an essay, editing the essay, revising it, rewriting, maybe doing it several times. Um, it is helping students develop disparate ideas from different sources and then weave these ideas together to create a coherent argument. It is helping students develop a thesis statement with supporting ideas and evidence and then presenting this in an organized fashion. It's helping students understand grammar and language convention and mechanics and word choice and spelling and punctuation. And it's, and I would say another difficult part of writing, again, not the technology, but teaching writing is helping students discover their own voice and getting their personality through in their writing. So these three examples that I've discussed here really show that using technology to improve student learning is much less about technology 
and it's much more about the thinking and the instruction that accompany the technology and that really underlie the technology. I think I'd like to just quickly add a really fourth um, high probability example of um, how technology improves student learning, and that's collaboration. And we know from research, and if any of you are familiar with the research of um, Johnson & Johnson on collaborative learning, we know that if, if students are taught to collaborate a certain way, that is, if groups are small, they're given a defined task, they're given um, distinct roles within each uh, group, they're assessed on these roles, um, they have to produce a product together um, with distinct responsibilities, that we see improvements in student learning. And this is where technology shines, because as we see right now from this interaction, technology allows us, the internet allows us to communicate and collaborate with people we've never met, or to communicate and collaborate with our colleagues, but in different ways. And so research really shows that collaboration helps students improve their learning. But more important, and this is research from John Hattie, the one variable that improves student learning over everything else is when students' teachers collaborate. So teach students whose teachers collaborate score higher in measures of academic achievement than students whose teachers do not collaborate. And again, I mentioned to you that Hattie looked at over 800 evaluations, so this is pretty reliable data. Um, and how can technology help with collaboration? And I would just say, my god, there's just a ton of social media sites from Facebook to Tumblr to Delicious to Edmodo to everything. Um, where we can communicate and collaborate with colleagues we know, we can communicate and collaborate with colleagues we don't know. Um, an organization like ITEN, the Inter-American Teacher Education Network, um, this, is a, this is a space. The internet is full of these sorts of spaces, but again, it gives, the internet gives people technology, gives people a forum um, through which they can collaborate, where they can communicate, where they can have their own personal learning networks um, where we are corresponding and sharing ideas with people all over the world. And this is something that I think we probably all do. I know that I certainly do. I have colleagues all over the world, some of whom I've met and some of whom I've never met. So let me just end here, and let's see if we can save some time for um, communication. And just really to conclude and to say this again, because I think this is important as teachers we're often pushed, we're often scolded for not using technology or enough of it or using the latest and greatest thing. And I just want to say and remind us all that you know, effective use of educational technology is not about technology. It is about instruction. So thank you all very much. Um, I have email address here. If you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them or you know, have a quick conversation with any of you. Um, I also keep. Uh, a site on Scoopit, um, and I add information there about educational technology across the globe and technology for teacher professional development. Um, Scoopit is a free site. You can go in and you can, anything you like, if, you, if you've used the site before, you, people post articles, they post resources, and then if you like it, you just grab it for free and you just send it off, and you can actually even create your own Scoopit sites. So let me stop here and go back to um, the WebEx, here we are, and see if there are any questions, any comments, anything.